Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining, and today we're continuing our series on agents of Satan. Now, last week we covered the Word of Faith movement, the prosperity gospel, and all of the heresies that come in that conglomerate, whether it be speaking things into existence, the little God's doctrine, but now we're covering something that is not foreign to conservative evangelicals. We're covering the heresy of hyper-dispensationalism or dispensational salvation. Now, dispensationalism started off in eschatology. It started off rather conservative, and it really got packaged into this theology, this entire theology ranging from creation to salvation to the afterlife, not just eschatology. It really got out of hand. So in order for us to understand dispensationalism and its hyperform, we must go back to the origin. Now, let me be clear. I'm not going to condemn these three men that I'm about to mention, but I think it's necessary that we understand how things got to where they are. So the beginnings of dispensationalism can be found in early Great Britain amongst a religious sect, and that religious sect was called the Brethren. And the Brethren started dispensationalism, and from there it was developed from someone who associated with them called John Nelson Darby. Now, Darby created his own translation of the Bible, which had some very questionable translations in it. But aside from that point, it really got packaged by someone named Clarence Larkin. Now, Clarence Larkin mapped it out. He wrote a book, and I have that book in front of me. It's called The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth in the World. And in this book, you can see uh, what looks like occultic drawings. You can see pyramids, and you can see all sorts of things in it of just drawing out maps and, and how this dispensation matches up with that dispensation. And you have to have all these charts to explain what they believe because it's so complicated. But, you know, Jesus didn't walk around with a hundred different charts. Paul didn't walk around with a hundred different charts. Anyways, I want us to continue from there. It was distributed across the United States by someone named Cyrus Schofield. Now, Cyrus Schofield didn't distribute it himself, but what he did do was he wrote his study Bible. You've heard of the old Schofield study Bible, and it's a Bible that has his notes in it. And it was funded by Oxford to get these study Bibles to seminaries, to preachers across the country. And in there were dispensational notes. Now, whether or not Schofield himself believed in dispensational salvation is still to be determined. There was one or two notes in his study Bible that kind of inferred that he was leaning that way. But I'm not going to make a judgment on that because I don't know what he actually believed. But that is how dispensationalism and the eschatology form and the name really got spread. It was through these three men. As I said early on, dispensationalism was eschatology. It, it had to do with the emphasis on the returning of the Jews and how they would be once again brought back into the fold. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. And then they brought in the pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm not really sure where I stand on anything uh, concerning that because there's so much stuff in there and so many different uh, convincing arguments. But from there, more false teachers came and built on dispensationalism. So it's not really the fault of these men. It's the fault of the people who came after. And one of those people that came after that created these heresies was someone named Peter Ruckman. And he taught hyper-dispensationalism and, and a bunch of heresies. So what does hyper-dispensationalism teach? Well, it teaches that God has given to man seven economies in which he has dispersed salvation differently through those economies. Now, many of you have probably heard, well, people were saved differently in the Old Testament than they are now. That's hyper-dispensationalism. And that's not necessarily uncommon in this country because it's been very popular in the West. So, that is untrue that people were saved differently, and we're going to get into that. But they teach that mankind has had different methods of salvation throughout the ages. They teach these dispensations as followed. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. And many of them will say there's much more, and they'll call each other heretics over how many dispensations there were, or when the church was started, and they'll... Do that until they're blue in the face. But what can we know about hyperdispensationalism? Well, we can know that it is a man-made structure. It is nowhere found in the Bible. So let's take a look at innocence, the first dispensation and their multiplication of charts. So they say that in innocence, in the dispensation of innocence, that Adam was saved by works. 
Well, how is that the case? How is that the case? Well, they say Adam was given the command not to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And by Adam abstaining from that, by abstaining from eating of that fruit, that was his salvation. But my friends, Adam had no need of salvation before the fall. He had no need of regeneration before the fall. He had not fallen, so he had no need for salvation. Now let's take a look at the dispensation of the law. Were people really saved differently by keeping the law? Were people at one point saved by works? Because they'll say until they're blue in the face, Abraham and David were saved by works. Romans 4 addresses this for us in verses 1 through 8. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Now those five words are very important. For what saith the scripture? Etch that into your mind. What does the scripture say? Not what does Robert Breaker say. Not what does Peter Ruckman say or Clarence Larkin. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So in other words, those who are working for their salvation, if they could work for their salvation, it would not be that they earned it by grace. It would be out of debt, that God would owe debt because they work for it. Pretty plain and simple. But that's not what the Bible's saying. The Bible's saying that it's not of works, it's of grace. Now let's continue. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then we see this, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without, what? Works. Without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So here we see that both Abraham and David were both saved by grace through faith. When works are mentioned here, they're mentioned as unsaving. Even for Abraham and David who fall under the dispensations of works. We see that it is all reliant on the unmerited favor of God Yahweh. Not works, not sacrifice, not human achievement, not human intelligence. And they'll say, well, yeah, dispensation, that word's in the Bible a couple times. Well, you know what else is in the Bible? predestination. You know what else is in the Bible? Election. And they will reject that all day, every day, 24-7. When dispensations are mentioned in the Bible, it's usually talking about dispersing something, dispensing the gospel. Hebrews 10 tells us that the sacrificing of animals could never take away sins. It is not possible. But they say that it was the salvation for those people. That was the salvation for the Jews back then. But here in Hebrews 10, read with me, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now, the writer of Hebrews does not say it is no longer possible, nor does the writer go on to even say, well, it was possible and now it's not. He says, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So what was it that took away sins? It was Christ's blood. Well, they'll say, well, Christ didn't die yet. Christ is called the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. You know, Christ had already died, in effect, from the foundation of the world. It was good as done. And that's what they don't understand because they do not believe in the sovereignty of God, nor do they wish to comprehend it. Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that is how his mercy is imputed unto us. Not by the blood of bulls and goats. That's worthless. That was all pointing towards the cross. What do you think the Passover was about? What do you think all these things about lambs without spot or blemish? Oh, do you think that lamb that had no spot or blemish was actually saving? No, that's foolishness. It was pointing towards Christ, the true lamb with no spot or no blemish of sin. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and there is no changing with God. He is immutable. The Old Testament to dispensationalists is about man, and it's not about God. They say, well, see, you had to have different dispensations for men in this time period. The Old Testament is about Christ, and the New Testament is about Christ. But they don't comprehend that. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Well, some of these dispensationalists are being very ignorant by their lack of knowledge and, and spiritual darkness about what the Bible says. 
I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. So they all ate the same spiritual meat that we eat and that they ate, the apostles wrote about. And then read this. And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was who? Was it the blood of bulls and goats? Was it works? Was it innocence? Was it the law? No, it says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So how do we know that Christ was the one being testified of, even in the Old Testament? Well, that should be first-hand knowledge to any born-again believer, but not to dispensationalists. But Christ said this. Christ said this to the Pharisees. He said that the Scriptures testify of me. He said, in them you think you have eternal life. But they are those that testify of me. But also we see this in Acts 26, uh, verses 22 through 23. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So right here we see the apostle is saying, hey, what I'm about to tell you, there is nothing different about what I'm about to tell you than what Moses and the prophets did say should come. So what is that? Verse 23. That Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So apparently Moses and the prophets were saying exactly that. But not to the dispensationalists. They were teaching, oh, well, you got to sacrifice this lamb to pay for your sins. That's not anywhere in the Bible. It was all pointing towards the cross. They say, well, how could they point towards the cross? They didn't know anything about a cross. They didn't know anything about the name Jesus. Well, Jesus is one with the Father. Jesus is Lord. How many times do you see the word Lord in the Bible? Elohim, Yahweh. That's Jesus. Dispensationalism seeks to paint God out as if he just put a system in place for man. And and, and since man fails, then God has to go and put another backup plan in place for that. And then once that dispensation fails... He must put a new system in place. And now apparently this dispensation that we're in, the dispensation of grace, will fail. And that's why the tribulation will come. And then works will be reintroduced into salvation. Yes, they believe works will be reintroduced into salvation. Now one of the most prominent dispensational teachers, he's actually a student of Peter Rockman, Robert Breaker says that your salvation in the tribulation will be this. That if you take the mark of the beast, You have to cut your hand off, physically. And if you've taken it in your forehead, well, you'll have to cut your head off. And I'm not making this up. Go on YouTube, look up Robert Breaker. He's a big dispensationalist taught by Ruckman, and he teaches out of Milton, Florida. He then went on to say, well, you know, if that's not a work, I don't know what is. And that's proof that, you know, you're saved by works in the tribulation because you'll have to cut your hand off or or not take the mark. And that's what's going to define your salvation. No, no, no. See, they have no concept of the sovereignty of God. They don't understand that once you're saved, a believer will never take that mark. The word of God tells us about these teachers in 1 Timothy 1, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Scripture tells us this, just as a synopsis. Scripture tells us that the blood of animals can never save. Scripture tells us that the spiritual rock that we follow is the same that the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament believers followed, and that same spiritual rock was Christ. Scripture tells us the prophets foretold the Messiah who paid for the sins of his people. It was never works. It was never the law. The law was there as a schoolmaster. The law was there to show us how far away we truly are from God as depraved humans. It was never a method for salvation. And the God of dispensationalism is a God who perpetually ends in failure because because he never knows what system will and will not work. A prominent dispensationalist teacher titled his lesson this on YouTube, quote, Every dispensation ends in disaster. You think? It's because these dispensations are created by men trying to make sense of the Bible. Unregenerate men trying to make sense of it. It's because these men have taken a shredder to the Bible and have cut it up into a million pieces. So what other heresies do they teach? 
Well, another heresy that they teach is that we are not to obey Christ and we're not to follow Christ's teachings. They say that we're only supposed to follow Paul. We're supposed to follow Paul, not Christ. Let's follow their own logic and let's get Paul on record and see what Paul thinks about this. 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, apparently Paul was going through some similar situation then where people wanted to be classified under this person and I'm a follower of this person. No, no, no. Christ is not divided. Paul was not crucified for you, nor were you baptized in the name of Paul. But some people are baptized, I guess, in the name of Peter Ruckman and Robert Breaker because that's what they want. They want to they make everything a sect. And they also teach that repentance is not needed to be saved. They preach that all you have to do is believe My friend, your belief of the gospel goes hand in hand with repentance. You cannot believe the gospel if you have not repented of your sins. They say, well, Paul didn't teach repentance. Paul did teach repentance in Acts. We see him talking to Agrippa. And what did he say in Acts 26? He said, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but shewed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. So apparently, not only does it make dispensationalists upset teaching repentance, but it made these people upset. That's because it calls man out on their sin, and dispensationalists don't like that. Dispensationalists think it's okay to be carnal, and it's okay to be depraved and wicked as long as you say you believe. So all the dispensationalists do is they try to lie and distort the gospel message. No repentance, no discipleship. They say they even go as far as to say that you can be saved and not produce any good works. They believe that all you have to do is just believe and have this easy believism. But what did Christ say? Christ said, does a corrupt tree produce good fruit? Or does a good tree produce bad fruit? Every tree that does not produce good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And that's just a paraphrase. You get the point. What needs to be understood about dispensationalism is that it was developed by unregenerate men who tried to make sense of something that they can't make sense of. Flesh and blood cannot reveal what the Bible means. Remember he said to Peter, he said, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. It takes divine revelation, and that's what these men lacked, and that's why they have to take a shredder to the Bible to make sense of all this. See, these unregenerate men that were involved in this dispensationalism, this hyper-dispensationalism, they never knew what it meant to produce good fruit. They never knew what it was like to follow Christ in discipleship and to give everything for Christ and to take up your cross and deny yourself because they never did it. They never experienced it. The Holy Spirit never moved on them. And they will show you chart after chart and drawing after drawing trying to explain it, but they can't explain it because flesh and blood cannot reveal these things to you. But they think Clarence Larkin can. But they think, oh, Peter Ruckman can. They can't explain what it means to live godly in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it's totally foreign to carnal-minded men. And another heresy they teach, and this is not as bad as the other ones, but they teach the heresy that those who were saved by God before Christ was crucified and resurrected, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom. They didn't go to heaven. Now, Abraham's bosom is a real place. And they get this from Lazarus going to Abraham's bosom and the rich man going to hell or Hades or whatever it's rendered. And Luke... And they say, well, it was not possible for believers to enter heaven because Christ had not yet been resurrected. So my question then is, where did Elijah go? Was he carried by chariots into Abraham's bosom, or did the scripture say he was carried into heaven? No, the Bible lets us know that Elijah went to heaven. And God is no respecter of persons. So with God not being a respecter of persons, why would he break his code of sending everybody else, including Abraham, to Abraham's bosom, but not Elijah. Now, furthermore, we see Enoch was translated and never saw death. Well, they'll say, well, Enoch still went to Abraham's bosom. Well, it says he never saw death. In Abraham's bosom, they call that the abode of the righteous dead. Now, in order to be in a place 
of righteous dead, you must be dead. And it says Enoch never saw death. He was translated. He was translated to heaven. Abraham's bosom is a location in heaven. And we see that, in fact, that Lazarus, since he was last on earth, he got to be first in the kingdom. And that was to be next to uh, a patriarch. Luke 13 tells us, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. It says there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. So he was saying, since you guys are all big on Abraham, and Abraham's your father, and your patriarch, that, that's the correlation, that Lazarus got to be with Abraham in heaven. So the point of this is that Lazarus was a Jewish beggar, and he was last on earth, and he was treated as first in heaven, and by being treated first, he got to be with Abraham in heaven. So I hope you learned quite a bit about what the dispensationalists believe in regards to salvation. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you don't need a hundred charts to explain the gospel. You need the Spirit to move on you. And then you will see what the gospel means. And you will see how precious the blood is. You don't need Clarence Larkin and Peter Ruckman and Robert Breaker and Gene Kim and all these people get on there and drawing on their boards trying to explain things to you. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It doesn't need the help of men, mere mortal men. So I hope that you learned a lot today, and and in our next message, we'll cover, uh, in Agents of Satan, we'll cover the heresy of progressive Christianity. So thank you, and God bless you. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome walk.